welcome to IEA Book Club. Uh, my name is Mark Glendenning. Before I introduce you to our guest author, Joanna Williams, I've been told by my sort of appropriate adult stroke political commissar for the evening, Alex Lee, who's organized uh, this event, that I have to make some very important announcements before we commence. First of all, uh, could you please switch off your mobile phones? Um, tonight's event, including the Q&A, is being uh, recorded and will be publicly available on the IEA website at some point. So if you don't want your employers or very wokey relatives to know you're here, then I suggest you keep a, uh, a low profile during the Q&A. Uh, and then I have to say something about the lavatorial uh, situation. You'll, you'll be shocked and indeed outraged to learn that the IEA still segregates its loos by <laughs> sex. Um, and so if you are a biological woman, if I'm allowed to use that word, um, go out through the door you came in from, turn sharp left, go down the stairs. If, on the other hand, you are a cis male, uh, then you go through that door, turn left, but then go through the door, out across the patio that's parallel to here, up some steps, and the loo is just there. It sounds very complicated, but I'm sure our commissar for this evening, Mr. Lee, will assist you if there are uh, any problems on that score. Um, on a less tawdry note, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Joanna. Uh, Joanna is one of the leading intellectuals and activists in and for the uh, Coalition for Cultural Freedom. I mean, that sounds a bit actually like a CIA front operation <laughs> from the Cold War. But I mean, the, the Free Speech Alliance, let us uh, call it that. Um, in addition to the book we'll be discussing this evening, How Woke One, uh, she has also written Women Versus Feminism, Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity, She's written very extensive papers on the Orwellian concept of hate speech and on transgenderism. And many of you here tonight and watching the recording will be familiar with her journalism. She's written for a, a wide variety of outlets from The Times, The Telegraph, the Spectator, Spiked Online, and indeed Living Marxism, let us not uh, forget. So, uh, Joanna, let me start by asking you um, uh, how you became interested, first of all, in these culture war type issues, why you have uh, devoted yourself really to analyzing this sphere of politics. Yeah, it's a good question to kick off with. I mean, I think just as I don't really see in my life um, as having made a huge leap from left to right, although I know that's how some people look at my work and kind of see that they see that I've made that trajectory. I don't feel as if I've made that huge leap myself. Um, likewise, I don't feel as if I've made a leap from dealing with kind of real politics to jumping into culture war issues as a separate thing. Um, for, to me, culture war issues are very much part of politics and, and in some ways the most important part of politics that we have nowadays. I don't see them as being in a separate realm to a, a different sphere of politics, if you like. Um, so I guess I've, I've been a political being all my adult life, so we're talking really 30 years now. And certainly 30 years ago when I joined, first of all, kind of the youth wing of militant labor and then the Socialist Worker Party before finally settling upon the Revolutionary Communist Party and living Marxism, there were things that I very firmly believed in then that I would say I, I still believe in now. Um, first and foremost, amongst those would be free speech. And I know it seems 
seems quite a surprise to say it nowadays, but you go back 30 years and, and more than 30 years ago, and free speech was not a right-wing value. Um, free speech was very much something that people on the left of politics um, fought for, and it was seen as if you wanted to have any uh, progress in terms of, of equal rights, racial equality, sexual equality, then you very much needed to make the case for free speech. So I guess the fact that I've stuck with that um, feels like the rest of the world might have changed, but I've had that as a consistent principle throughout. So I guess in fighting for free speech, one thing I became very interested in probably about 10 years ago now, is how free speech is challenged, not so much by formal laws and um, rules against what you can and can't say, but, but what I termed in my book on academic freedom, a kind of culture of conformity, a sense that there are some things that you just don't say in polite society, um, a sense that there are some things which are off limits politically if you work in a university, for example. And I think in exploring woke, that was something that I was very, very much interested in. Where do these ideas come from? How do they crystallize? And how do they create this climate where you become aware that there are a kind of acceptable set of values and opinions to hold and an unacceptable set of values and opinions? Um, and I was very, very keen to tease that out. So I think that's one thing. But the other thing I think that's really stuck with me through 30 years of being involved in politics and really shapes my influence in woke, and that's the idea of class, of social class. Um, I guess that lies at the heart of a Marxist analysis of society, breaking down um, society into different classes and looking at how uh, tension between different classes in society really plays out. And for me, um, I think woke is the modern day form of class politics. I mean, this is how class prejudice is expressed nowadays through uh, woke ideas, woke language. Um, woke makes it very acceptable to insult working class people, for example. Um, you've got these phrases like gammon and Karen. If people are not familiar with those, we can explain at the end. But um, you know, you, you, it makes it possible for, for these insults to be hurled, but also more than that, it makes it possible for um, a kind of professional managerial class, I don't want to preempt a question we're going to come on to, but a, a kind of elite section of society to define themselves, to demarcate them from the rest of the population. And it becomes the form through which power is exercised nowadays, I would say. so. I guess the reason why I'm, I was interested in exploring woke was because it is, it is the form in which censorship occurs nowadays, restrictions on free speech occur, but it's also the form in which class politics operates. And, and I would say that those two things in particular have been quite consistent um, trends that have motivated me politically pretty much throughout the whole of my adult life. Uh, and you know, if, if believing in and being interested in those things has flipped me from left to right, well, I, I kind of am a bit relaxed about that and leave other people to worry about the specific label um, that, that's going to be attached to me for holding those views. Um, I mean, a sort of comment that comes to mind before I ask you the, the next question, but which others may want to uh, develop later is that for many people on the, the center right, wokeness uh, is sometimes presented as a sort of cultural Marxism, some sort of uh, um, follow up from classical Marxism. So we may we may come back to that. So it's quite inter very interesting to hear what you've just said about that. Um, as you comment in the book, the woke tendency is very difficult uh, to define. It's not yet a cohesive ideology, the people who advance the multitude of positions associated with it uh, don't typically take philosophical ownership of it. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, I mean, going back to your reference about uh, conservatives who wanted to shut down uh, freedom of speech, um, the religious right, particularly the kind of Mary Whitehouse type people, uh, were very overt about 
well, who they were and what they were about and why they thought it was justified to, to suppress uh, free speech. Uh, so what is it that enables us to conceptualize woke as a, a movement or a distinct body of thought at all? Yeah, it's a really good question, a really tricky question to have to answer as well. It was one of the main challenges that I, I confronted in trying to write the book. How, how exactly do you identify what woke is and who woke people are? And um, somebody asked me the other day if I could actually name the 100 most woke people in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds like one of those Channel 5 television programs, you know, exactly. the first 50 worst singles ever and all that, yeah. I kind of got Owen Jones, <laughs> Gary Lineker. Uh, it's a good party game, a kind of drinking game for afterwards. Um, but it's difficult. I think because very few people nowadays declare themselves to be woke, exactly as, as you were saying, Mark, and there isn't really a badge that people wear, which I don't, I mean, I guess during the past few weeks, you'd say people who were displaying the pride flag with all the different um, LGBTQ symbols um, on it, you know, you could be pretty sure that they were probably woke people. But, but not only do woke people kind of deny being woke, but I think the point I'm trying to make in the book as well is that they actually deny the power that they've got in society as well. They deny the fact that they are now people who are very influential in the civil service, in universities and in the media and in shaping the way that society is. So you've got this, this kind of body of thought, if you like, that, that nobody claims ownership of and nobody who is actually in a powerful position off the back of that body of thought claims to be powerful. So it is a very, very tricky thing. And the danger that I really wanted to avoid was to be seen to be conspiratorial about this because I don't think there is a woke conspiracy. I don't think um, woke people kind of get together and say, you know, kind of, Psst, if you take care of the gender side of things, we'll take care of the race side of things and we'll have stitch, things stitched up between us. I don't, I don't think that happens. I think you've almost got a series of, of coincidences, if you like, which makes it sound far too loose. And, and I think there's certainly very useful coincidences and useful, politically useful and um, useful in terms of people's careers and useful in terms of people advancing their social status and their position in society that, that does allow for some um, coalescing around a body of ideas. But, but actually, the thing that makes it difficult for us as critics of woke is being able to identify exactly what the parameters of this body of ideas are and, and who's label it, who, who is coming up with these ideas. And I think that's not helped by the fact that um, I'm sure you can see in, in just over the past few years, if we stop and think about this, how quickly these ideas change and move on. Um, so we were just talking about the pride flag just before we came this evening. And, you know, if we were sat here three years ago, the rainbow flag would have been quite sufficient in and of itself to, to show that you were a, a woke person, you were at the cutting edge of, of political correctness and, and pride month. But nowadays, obviously, you have to have the transgender triangle cut into the top of it. You have to have the intersex symbol put on. You have to have acknowledgement of the intersection between critical race theory um, and pride and gay people. As you were saying earlier, Mark, actually don't get a look in anymore in the pride flag. You know, that this is... Yeah, they've been kind of edged out because <laughs> exactly. the more they add new staff, <laughs> the rainbow will be completely obliterated. Totally. Totally. But, but I guess this is just an example of how quickly these things move on and, and how if you want to be at the cutting edge of, of woke and have these woke credentials, it's actually quite a hard task just to keep up with what's going on. But but who who's the kind of godlike figure who's sitting atop of all this, who kind of sits presumably somewhere on Regent Street, high up in an <laughs> elevated position and says, you know, I now decree that the rainbow flag must have this trial triangle in its top left hand corner you know who that person is 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 nameless you know but there so is 
<laughs> well, he would definitely be on my list of 100 white people, but, but whether he's actually the person pulling the strings behind all of this, you know, is doubtful. It, it's a collective endeavor. But in terms of just, just to come back to your question, you know, what, what is pulling it all together? What, what can we identify? And I think there are distinct political trends that, that push in the same direction. And clearly, the political trend towards identity politics is driving this, is one of the key factors behind this. And I think we can see people who followed what's gone on, particularly in, in left-wing politics, but also increasingly, I think, on the right as well, um, over the course of uh, probably far longer than we actually give credit for in most discussions about woke. I would say really over the course of a good three, four decades now, a shift away from a politics that's focused on class and class issues towards identity and identity identity groups. And like I said, I think this has been most noticeable on the left, which has seen a very forceful rejection of class in some instances um, towards identity groups. But I think increasingly it's something which you spot on the political right as well. But I think it's not enough just to point to identity politics in and of itself. The other trend, which I think is really important that I identify in the book, is towards a, a, a kind of celebration of victimhood, a kind of victimhood culture. And I think where the two things coalesce is around this idea that, that you can almost create hierarchies of, of privilege and hierarchies of victimhood and, and in shaping society around these hierarchies, which to be clear, it's not always the most victimized groups who get to speak the loudest, but it's people who assume the moral authority to act on behalf of these victimized identity groups who, who can speak the loudest. So I think there's, there's kind of distinct theoretical justifications uh, that tie these things together, whether that's uh, playing out in practice in um, gender theory or in critical race theory. You see these things underpinning many of the ideas which we would label as woke. But I think, just very quickly, the way this plays out in practice uh, is also kind of show some very concrete um, examples, if you like, uh, and that enable us to identify woke. So uh, we talked about something very fast moving, but I think it's the vocabulary that you have to look at, the way our vocabulary has changed <laughs> and how certain groups of people are kind of in on what the correct vocabulary is to use and how the vocabulary can be very subtle, very subtle differences, which can mean the difference between kind of like and death, if that's not too dramatic a way to put it. But the difference, for example, between saying colored people and being entirely cast out of polite society, but knowing that, that people of color, if you think linguistically, the, the difference there between colored people and people of color is a, is a very subtle linguistic rhetorical difference. And yet the meaning that those words carry in terms of your status, your career, your, your signaling to the world that you're an insider or an outsider is absolutely huge. And we're talking kind of two syllables there. You know, that's vocabulary. Again, very interesting, you know, the way a lot of woke indoctrination Doctrination, I would argue, takes place through training, and it's actually called training. You know, if you're in the workplace nowadays, you'll be sent on training. In universities, even, you're sent on training. Now, training is is not a opportunity. It's not very different to education. Training is not an opportunity for you to raise questions, to engage in debate Certainly or discussion. <laughs> you know, training has right and wrong answers. Yeah. Um, and what's more, what's <laughs> the expected outcome of training is behavioral differences. You, you demonstrate having been correctly trained in how you behave, not in any differences in what you might think. And you also see certain practices. You know, the, the most recent one that's hit the headlines has been the practice of pronoun badges, which, again, if you were to try and explain, I'm sure if we could kind of have a time machine and go back 10 years and try and explain to somebody, even just 10 years ago, the whole concept of a pronoun badge and why a pronoun badge might be seen as some important you know the people would think you were off another planet people would not have any idea what you were on about and yet banks shops pronoun badges have become kind of de rigueur nowadays um, 
you touched on earlier um, the class dimension of this. Um, that, that wokeism, as you see it, is very much uh, about a set of values and positions that have emanated from a managerial sort of bourgeois elite class, the sort of new class that George Orwell and Milovan de Gilles, forgive my Serbo Croatian uh, <laughs> pronunciation, but the, the, the kind of theories that they were writing about in previous. Uh, Ares, I wonder if you want to, to sort of briefly elaborate as to what you think the woke ideology, if we can call it that, or set of positions, what function does it serve for this particular type of class interest? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just coming back very briefly to the coming to the title of the book very briefly in terms of how woke won, and again, I'm sure it's something we'll come on to in the, the question and answers, but. The danger with the title of my book, How Woke Won, is I think it can make it seem as if woke ideas and woke thinking were so powerful and have been so influential that they've kind of swept away everything in their path and they've assumed this cultural dominance, uh, which you know I think they have and that's why I've, I've put the title. But I think in some ways that can, be, can give a misleading impression as to the power of, of woke ideas and the power of woke people. I think in practice what happened was that you've got institutions, well pretty much every institution in society, I'm, I'm afraid to say, from university schools the civil service, the media, all, all these institutions that, that essentially have become quite hollowed out of purpose. You know, and, and again, this is something which is extending back over a period of, of, of decades, where if you think the, the purpose of a school or the purpose of a university was intrinsically bound up in education, was intrinsically bound up in the pursuit of knowledge, of transmission of knowledge, in um, discerning the best that's been thought and said, and, and having a kind of Rethian, if you want to think of it in terms of the BBC, um, sense that there are some things that are worth passing on to the next generation, that there are some things that are so beautiful or so important um, to the functioning of society, to, to being human, um, that we want the next generation to know these things. And for me, the way I see it is the way woke, the reason why woke has been so successful is because before woke ideas ever came onto the scene, these, these institutions lost that sense of purpose. They lost that sense of, of what are we intrinsically here for. Um, they gave up on any project of, of being able to pass on the best that's been thought and said, if you like, or of knowledge or beauty, or even if that's just the civil service, and I'm saying this even if, as in, if, as if this is a trivial thing, which I don't think at all. I think it's actually a really, really important thing of actually keeping the country running and functioning as an important thing in and of itself, in fact, that you were a servant to the nation, you kept the nation running. And it's almost as if any belief in these things has been abandoned, has been hollowed out. So you then have these institutions that have got this vacuum at the heart of them. They've got no overarching sense of purpose. They've got no sense of direction of, of what's motivating them. So I think the key role that woke plays is it gives these institutions a sense of purpose, it gives them a sense of direction. If you run um, the passport office, for example, I actually think producing passports for people is a really, really important thing to do. Uh, producing driving licenses for people is a really important thing to do. Uh, teaching undergraduates basic knowledge that they need within their subject area is a really important thing to do. But it's almost as if the people doing these things have given up on those goals. They don't seem enough anymore. They seem, they seem purposeless. They seem to not be worthwhile in and of themselves. They don't seem to be sufficient to motivate people. Whereas if you can bring in this kind of um, exterior goal that suddenly your purpose in life is to um, challenge racism, to make everybody aware of the existence of transgender people, to um, 
um, challenge or to, to kind of push the boundaries in terms of the gender non-binary, for example, then you create for yourself not just this really exciting and as they see it, really exciting and interesting sense of purpose that's way more interesting than just stamping passports or, or ticking off people's driving licenses, but it's a sense of purpose that enables you to take the moral high ground on everyone else in society, suddenly you create this justification for your role and you create this sense of moral superiority for yourself in terms of what you do. And it also has the benefit of, of creating a moral sense of purpose that, that people can cohere around, that, that can unite and, like I said earlier, kind of demarcate you from other people in society. So I think woke really serves our professional and managerial class very, very well indeed. And presumably it also gives them patronage. I mean, it direct power, not just a sense of purpose, but actual power in terms of redistributing who gets what, who gets different types of position, who gets status. Completely, and I think that's um, most obvious in the workplace where a lot of people have said to me, you know, well, why this, this kind of slogan, go woke, get, get woke, go broke, you know, why do businesses want to go down the line of, of woke capitalism, isn't it, or just woke washing, isn't it just a kind of con, it, it's just a pretense, you know, we'll be a little bit woke over here, but really we're still very interested in making money over there. Now, I'm not pretending businesses aren't interested in making money, but woke becomes the way in which they do make money, and it gives um, employers enormous power, if you can dictate that your staff all have to wear pronoun badges, for example, um, you not just have the power to kind of divide and rule amongst your own staff, you're asking them, um, I wrote this in my spiked article the other week, you know, not just for their time, but you're, it's almost as if you then have access to your workers' souls, you know, the intrinsic sense of who they are, their identity, suddenly you have access to, to the very kind of thoughts and feelings of your staff members, which, which hands enormous power over to bosses. Um. Because I, I want to bring in the, the audience a moment. I'm going to cut short my number of questions, but I want to ask you a, a last question. Um, is it fair to characterise to characterize the woke movement as a serious long-term threat to liberal democracy? Are we experiencing a new counter-enlightenment? Now, that might seem rather overblown, uh, a bit shrill. But it seems to me there is a profoundly authoritarian logic at the heart of new left thinking because of the importance it attaches particularly to language. It sees language as a, as, as a form potentially of coercive power. So I'm just going to read you a quote from a Labour MP called Nadia Whittam, who's the MP for Nottingham East, which I think encapsulates the anti-democratic potential uh, within uh, wokeism. She says, we must not fetishize debate as though debate is itself an innocuous neutral act. The very act of debate is an effective rollback of assumed equality and a foot in the door for doubt and hatred. Well, if you, ser if you seriously believe that, then presumably the more censorship you have, the more you curtail um, uh, debate, discussion within civil society, the more free that society is. Mm, no. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, I disagree with the premise of your question only in so much as I don't think it's overblown at all to describe this as a counter-enlightenment uh, movement. I, I absolutely 100% see woke as being a counter-enlightenment movement um, in a number of respects. I mean, the first one, perhaps most fundamentally, is to do with the nature of knowledge. And for me, lots of the, the kind of most fundamental ideas are associated with the Enlightenment were about pushing the boundaries of knowledge of, of what people know. And you could only do that on agreed principles of, of what knowledge is, what knowledge means, and how do we advance knowledge. And the number one way in which 
which knowledge was advanced was through a battle of ideas, through we present bad ideas, we present good ideas, we let them kind of battle it out and you have a kind of survival of the fittest in terms of, of knowledge and that's how society advances, bad ideas fall by the wayside, good ideas live to fight another day and, and what woke thinking does is it, it's a very relativist, it, it defines knowledge in terms of people's identity uh, which is the most backward thing to say that suddenly we've got the idea that there's kind of women's knowledge, women's ways of knowing, um, the, the kind of the, in, the intuitive, the touchy feeling. I mean it sounds kind of pagan actually. It <laughs> is, it, it, it's incredibly yeah. backward and regressive or you know that there's kind of black people's knowledge that exists distinct from white people's knowledge, you know that to me that, that just really is so backward a way of looking at it, an incredibly divisive way and it, it stops societies progressing, it stops us advancing our knowledge of the world but in to put that in kind of more concrete terms I guess and, and more recent terms, if you look at all the gains of the civil rights era um, that occurred over the past, uh, again you know I'm going back to the kind of 1950s, 1960s now, but in terms of racial equality, in terms of sexual equality, um, genuine advances where, I mean, obviously society's not been perfect and I wouldn't want to point to a golden age and say, you know, if we just could go back to 1963, you know, or 1967, everything was perfect at that point in time. Clearly there's never been a golden age where everything was perfect, but I think uh, at a certain point of the civil rights movement, there was at least a promissory note. There was at least an aspiration of, of kind of ideas like one race, the human race, or, or that people would be judged on the content of their character, not the colour of their skin. You know, and, I, and I think that that aspiration, even if it was never fully materialised, um, was far more progressive than where we are now, where we don't even have those aims anymore. In fact, we're told that even to have those aims, makes us a racist person or makes us a sexist person or a homophobic person. It seems to me that, that we're rushing headlong into a society where we're being asked to judge people on the basis of their race, their gender, their sexuality in a way that's entirely regressive. We're, we're taking the most I mean, to use a very trivial word, the most boring parts of people's lives, and we're elevating these biological facts that, that in many instances people have very little control over to being the most fundamentally important parts of, of someone's life, and we're now being asked to make judgments on who's privileged, who's not privileged, based on, on biology, which to me takes us back over 100 years, overturns 100 years of social progress. And I think that's what, why it's so important that we fight against these things. I mean, as you say in the book, one of the great ironies is that this movement presents itself as being anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic for equality, for diversity. And yet, of course, actually, it's the complete opposite. It doesn't believe in illegal equality quite overtly. It says, well, you have to treat people in groups differently. Well, that means you can't have individual legal equality. Um, you can't have diversity of opinion uh, and so on and so forth with these other aspects, which I think is one of the most uh, brilliant bits of the book uh, in terms of explaining how wokeism is in fact. But it has this double speak whereby I, some people perceive it to be progressive, take it at its own face value. You even get some centre-right commentators saying, oh, well, this is a form of hyper-liberalism. Well, there's nothing liberal about this. But I think we should now throw it open to you guys. I don't know who's got the mic. Ah, great, Reem has. Um, so I don't know if you want to come down here and then we might start on this side of the room, this gentleman here. Thank you, thank you for your, um, your hearing of me, okay? Thank you for the presentation. I, I think my point comes on top of the last question you raised about the enlightenment. The enlightenment was about rational debate and scientific inquiry. And my theory is that uh, in an increasingly secular society, a large portion of the population need a religious belief 
actually. And so what we're talking about is almost a new religion. So we are reversing what has happened during the Enlightenment. And this is the new religion. And with religion, it's impossible to debate it. You can't debate the existence of God. And what we're talking about, wokery, is the new God. And you, you can't rationally debate it. That, is, that, yeah, is that not the issue? <laughs> Do you want me to come back yes, to it? Yes, please. please. Um, now, I've heard lots of people um, draw this parallel before, and I, I think it's a really interesting parallel because in practice, in the way rituals play out, for example, I think there are so many parallels that you can see in, in having the correct kind of language, expressing the kind of performance of certain rituals that we might go through, uh, whether it's a different time of year, you know, we, we reject Advent, we have Pride Month, for example, the, the rituals involved in taking the knee, um, the, the acts of penance for white privilege, um, the purchase of indulgences, almost, you know, there, there are so many parallels, but... So, I, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but you, you, you mentioned earlier these fascinating dinners you can buy for $5,000, which I think... Yeah, no, I this think that's is in uh, uh, America. I think they are a bit ahead of the game with us here, um, you, where you see people. Uh, it, it's a kind of if if I was going to draw a pattern. So my religious background is Catholic. I'm Catholic, and um, yeah, I still wake up in cold sweat at night about my own first confession and first Holy Communion and all of that kind of malarkey. Um, and and this idea of original sin and, and penances, and you certainly see a lot of that. I mean, white privilege is definitely an original sin. I mean, the, the parallels write themselves and the kind of the acts of, of forgiveness and, and the penances that you might pay, you know, whereas I was told to go away and say 10 Hail Marys and three Our Fathers or whatever, you can see the same kind of forms of ritual penance that people serve nowadays. You know, Mark's on about the kind of race for dinner in the US where people pay extortionate sums of money to have people tell them how racist and how privileged and, and terrible people they are but you, you see this in many other areas but um, I guess I'm, I'm reluctant in some ways to move too much beyond the practice because I, you know I, I don't I haven't properly thought this out fully but but to me there, there was something if I'm reluctant to say positive about religion. I mean, I, I've, I've dropped much of the Catholicism, all of the Catholicism, really, that I grew up with. But I guess in terms of a belief in God, a God, whoever your God might be, you know, perhaps there's something universal, a universal aspiration in a belief in God. You know, if you think of religion at, it, at, its, at its best, you know, the idea that, that people would be equal under God, you know, or, or that that there was something that I don't know. I, to me, it just almost seems something a bit more positive about a belief in God and a belief in in religion, old school style. That that woke just does not offer. To me, woke seems very nihilistic. Can, can I add? I, what I meant was exactly what you said. That people. Sorry, can you wait for the mic? Yeah. yeah. So we can record it. Stop other people from asking questions. I wanted to add that I think what you're saying is that underlying what I my, the point I made was that people have this need that I think you've just described, and this is replacing that need for a faith, a belief in something, and it's the power of needing that faith that I was really describing. Yeah, I guess the way I would see that playing out is, is much more in, in the way I was describing in terms of institutions. Um, you, you, you can't sustain an institution that lacks all sense of purpose. So universities, I think, are really the um, example par excellence in this regard, you know, where they are having abandoned a search for truth with a capital T, which in the olden days, very olden days, might have been tied up with a religious sense of mission um, or truth as in the word of God. Uh, having moved away from that, you can see how they've, they've struggled really 
really is is their role to provide skills for employability to feed people into the labour market is their role just satisfied student customers or, or what can they do that gives a sense of moral purpose that goes beyond workplace skills or just satisfied students and and I think even if not at the level of the individual at the level of institution providing this kind of moral purpose and moral justification I think is a really important role that Woke fulfills. Okay what we're going to do now um, we'll go to Joanne but then after that we'll take uh, Viv I think I saw Nick also put his hand up uh, and Christian and then we'll move down to Sheldon and Peter. So, and if we could ask the questions quite succinctly because of, of the time, because I know you, a lot, there's, there's, there's plenty of booze to still be consumed. <laughs> um, thank you, Joanna. I, what I wanted to ask you is whether you had any sense of where this goes next, mm. because you referred, uh, I think, absolutely accurately to the sense in which this has just moved so fast that you know, five years ago, maybe even only three years ago, the pronoun badges would have just been seen as absolutely absurd. So, you know, we've seen this breakdown of, of how we're supposed to judge each other in terms of our ethnicity, our colour, um, our gender, um, our sexuality. Uh, I mean, where the heck do we go next? What's the next frontier? Is it transhumanism? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to comment on transhumanism, I'm afraid, because that's something I really know very, very little about. I mean, I, I think the thing that's quite exciting, if you like, and keeps me going on a daily basis, um, fighting around these issues, is that it seems to me, probably unlike most periods perhaps um, in recent times everything's to play for at the moment and you know I think it things really could go either way and you see there have been quite a few notable pushbacks against woke and I don't think I don't think all is lost or all is won yet at all but I think what's exciting is that the the there is still a lot to play for um, if you look at what's going on in schools, for example, uh, in terms of the impact of gender ideology in schools or the role of Stonewall, for example, I think if we were sat here even just a year ago, Stonewall was much more this monolithic or powerful um, charity. Charity makes it sound far too nice and, and warm and fuzzy, um, but, but had enormous influence that we didn't even know half the time how influential exactly it was. And yet a year of, of the, the spotlight being shone on the influence that Stonewall's having and it just shows people don't like it when they see it and, mm -hmm. and that tide of popular opinion really does force institutions and companies on the um, on the defensive. It's very interesting, you know, I'm sure people have been following the whole saga around the Halifax and the pronoun badges mm -hmm. and um, it was the guy who, Howard, I'm sure people know, who was doing the um, adverts for Halifax, uh, the black guy with the milk bottle type glasses, and he has come out and said that he doesn't think this is a good idea that Halifax is going down this line. And, you know, suddenly you can see how the, perhaps the next company um, that was sat there waiting in the wings to tweet about its pronoun badges might just be beginning to think twice when it sees the reaction that this has had. So, I have no crystal ball, I can't see. I mean, you can see one trajectory that could be disastrous, and it seems to me, you know, the most nightmare scenario is that we have, we, we carry on down the line what we're hurtling into, and, and we go even further with, with, I mean, really what I can only describe as the grooming of children through education um, to, to drop all boundaries that they might have, give up on any sense of, of themselves that they are. You know. uh, but another trajectory could be that we push back against this. Um, talking of transhumanism, I was sent um, an email uh, with somebody professing to being a human-avian hybrid. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if at some point people start demanding legal recognition uh, uh, in relation to these new extraordinary forms of identity. They're getting it to a certain extent in the States, if not actually legal. 
then people are, are paying lip service to this, which is the kind of you know, yeah. precursor of the legal change potentially. Um, so we're going to take uh, Viv, then Christian, and then Nick. So if you could all make your points, and then you can respond to, the, to whatever questions you take your fancy, or all of them. And then we'll move further down here. I feel like I'm being more pessimistic than I, I actually think. Uh, but I, I've been thinking a lot around the kind of victimhood and the Olympian victimhood. And my feeling is is it, the question is, is it new? But what seems to be new these days is that it, the authoritarianism isn't coming from above, well, it is, but it's also people asking the state or an institution or an HR department to, to <coughs> act on their behalf. So they're advocating responsibility. They see themselves as quite infantile as a victim that needs this authoritarian help. And of course, that's the antithesis of a free society, because it's really naturally doing freedom. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know where the question is, but you know where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christian? Do you think it's fair to say that wokery is mostly a form of status competition? Because if that's what it is, that would explain why it is accelerating so quickly and why it's getting more and more unhinged. If you have too many people who want to be part of a moral elite, then the problem is, an elite is always, by definition, very small. We can't all be part of a moral elite, right? We, we can all imitate woke words, we can have, everyone can be, can sound woke, but that doesn't mean that we can all be part of the moral elite. So it then means uh, it's not enough to just be woke, you have to be woker than the next guy, <laughs> and it turns into an arms race. And, and therefore, uh, at the moment, since you mentioned the pronoun badges as an example, at the you know moment, pronoun is? badges are still a bit unusual. Uh, but let's say in five years' time, every major company has pronoun badges. Uh, what do you do then? That no, then it's no longer uh, it no longer confers elite status, and you have to come up with something new, and ideally something that's even more uh, out there and a bit wacky, so that uh, people don't imitate it too quickly. And Nick, I think if you just pass the yeah. uh, Nick, she, her, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a sense of, of how many people actually believe this stuff, as opposed to profess it? Mm -hmm. uh, question number one. And question number two is, is this just end of empire stuff? Because the book hasn't won in Africa or Asia yet. I don't think it has it. Yeah, I'm so, yeah, sorry. We'll come, we'll <laughs> so I'm so amazed at the questions. I was just stunned into silence. No, great questions. Thank you. Um, you know, there's obviously I've got no definite answer. You'd have to rig people up to lie detector tests to uh, work out whether people genuinely are the true believers or whether they're going along with this. Um, but uh, but I think the very fact that you raised the question shows that this is is an important thing to ask. And you, my guess would be that the proportion of true believers is far smaller than the people who profess it and go along with it for a quiet life. And I think that provides a, a chink in the armour, if you like, for scope for, for pushing back against it. And certainly in my own experience, I know that if you do stick your head above the parapet, ask a few questions, you certainly find some of the people who you assumed were going along with it, who were professing it rather than being the true believers, are, are kind of quite relieved that you've done that and are happy to, to join in. Um, criticizing it, you suddenly find that there's not that much substance behind it. Um, but there again, I would argue that's the case for the true believers as well. Uh, you know, what, what's, what is actually intellectually pushing this through for, forward, you know, many of the true believers, there's very, very little actual substance there. They're not very good at um, defending their own arguments. And half the time, I think that's why they run away from debate, like Nadia Whitmore MP, whose quote you were reading out. You know, they don't want to um, put their ideas, make their ideas subject to scrutiny because they struggle to actually defend the ideas that they're proposing. Um, you know, on the, the victimhood um, and, in a way, the status competition, I think those two things very much going hand in hand there. Uh, I think this is a, a really, really important point, you know, and, and people 
uh, do almost need to almost be forced to be free to confront and I know I'm not the first person to say that um, but, <laughs> but, but to actually confront freedom um, and be pushed into being free and it is an uncomfortable proposition but I think the thing that surprises me um, particularly around the and I think this is most obvious around trans ideology but it also I think becomes um, obvious in even in issues around race and critical race theory uh, to some extent as well, how often this is not people from the identity groups themselves who are at the forefront of proposing these ideas or arguing for new clampdowns. Often, particularly with gender, it's people who are kind of self-appointed spokespeople for these identity groups. So if you look at the most virulent trans activists, for example, um, you know, some of them certainly are transgender people themselves, but I think you also have a, a large proportion who are not transgender, who were assuming that they have the right to speak on behalf of transgender so it's, people. So it's almost like a new kind of theory of the vanguard party. Sorry to go back to <laughs> yeah. your uh, political history, but I mean, the, 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 the Communist Party would claim to speak for the working class in societies in which there were no contested elections and they would say well you know we speak for the working class and the working class wants socialism so you've got a kind of it's interesting you've just said that because there's a kind of it seems to me there's a sort of parallel whereby these crt theorists are claiming they speak for an entire category of people but what's the evidence for it i mean i'd be Reluctant to go too far down the historical parallels just because I think you've got to look at my Marxism tells me you have to look at things in the context. I was just trying to gently provoke <laughs> In you. which you find them. <laughs> and I, I think the context that we've got nowadays is, is very, very different because it's premised on an anti working class idea, if you like. But I think the, the race, a critical race theory, again, is another very, very good example of this where. Uh, this is a horrible thing to, to say and to talk about, but I think this is very much how it plays out in practice, where the woke, woke thinking almost divides kind of good black people from bad black people or good transgender people from bad transgender people. And so you can see how there are the, the kind of the good people are those who go along, who play up to the identity politics script that's been written for them. Um, whereas if you take somebody like Kemi Bader, Knock, for example, um, who will challenge and, and contradict the woke script or, or Pretty Patel, I guess, would be another good example um, of somebody who doesn't just go along with the victim line or go along with the, the kind of predetermined woke line that identity politics would dictate that somebody of their gender or their skin colour should take. Suddenly they get cast out, you know, they're inconvenient they're the wrong kind of black person or the wrong kind of woman uh, and they they are not be and, and this ties in exactly with what Viv was saying because the reason why they're wrong is because they're not playing up to the victim mentality they're not asking for help and they're not asking they're not being pathetic you know they they are kind of important powerful people who are saying we're important and powerful and um, we don't want help from other people to speak on our behalf you know we, we're quite capable of speaking on our own behalf and, and that's where the you suddenly realize that a lot of this is actually quite hollow that, that there is this authoritarian agenda behind it that is way above and beyond the um, the victimhood on the the kind of status competition you know I, I do think I think in some ways that's an important point, but I think I'm not suggesting that you're doing this for one second, but I, I worry that in some sections um, of critiquing woke, there's an assumption that we can allow this to eat itself, that eventually it will just all kind of swallow itself up and, and consume itself. And, and I think we can't afford to be complacent, even in this kind of um, uh, status competition. I think it's a really good way in which you described it there. Um, you know, 
these elites, they won't eat themselves. They will just reassert their own dominance without a challenge from the outside. Uh, and just quickly before we move on to the next two questions, I mean, next point about why this ideology doesn't seem to have the same traction in Africa and Asia. And I would also argue the sort of the Latin world. This seems to me, you know, in France or Italy or Greece, this kind of stuff really doesn't play. You don't get many French transgenderists or vegans or what have you. Um, well, obviously not in France, because they, they like eating meat, clearly, um, <laughs> and in Argentina. But um, so the Latin world seems to somehow be in a kind of better place uh, and the African world than, than we are. Is there something about the Anglosphere that this ideology yeah. seems to have more traction? No, it's a very, very good question. Um, uh, you know, I guess I guess we do we do export these ideas, and it worries me a lot the role of organisations like Oxfam, for example, um, that uh, that do carry these ideas around the world. And I think social media as well is very good at, at spreading these ideas. And I do think that if you look at some countries in Africa, you know there is there is a, a real danger that you do get the emergence of an elite that's in um, hock to, at the same time, in hock to Western cultural elites, if you like, um, that is having to initially pay lip service to these ideas, but then they take root and become ingrained a little bit as well. Um, but that's not to, to say, but, you know, I do recognise the point that's being made. Clearly, these ideas have not wholesale gained ground yet. I mean, thank goodness. Um, whether that's because there are just more pressing material concerns and, you know, you try going over to South Sudan, um, you know, refugee camp where people really are living hand to mouth and start saying, well, it's very important that you wear your pronoun badges. And, you know, people are not going to have the, you know, the, yeah. the time for that in that, that kind of society where, in a way, and again, this is not a phrase that I've quoted, I've, I've coined by any stretch, I want people to think so, but, but there is a certain luxury to woke thinking, you know, that there is a, a luxury belief idea um, and, and, in a way, it's a, a sign of, of not just the material progress that we've made, although clearly, I think I would argue there's a lot, lot more material progress we still have to make as a society. Um, but as I was saying earlier, more to the point that the kind of the hollowing yeah. out, the moral vacuum that we've got, that these luxury beliefs then fill that gap. Um, whereas I guess some societies around the world are just not in a position to be quibbling over luxury beliefs to the extent that, that we are. Um, you know, um, I have more to say on that, but, but I'll come back yeah, to Yeah, well, um, so Sheldon and then Peter and then, and you want, yes, and then Reem. So we'll. Hi. I really wanted to deal with the issue of uh, stop and search and knife crime. Now we know that a lot of black people have been involved with knife crime. So is it acceptable, or is it acceptable that you target that group uh, because you want to save a life? And this targeting of groups can be applied to terrorism. We also know that certain people who are terrorists tend to be from a particular group. So, in that sense, is it okay, broadly speaking, to target an identity group? Okay, and then Peter? Uh, you, you mentioned that universities have lost their sense of purpose. But it, it seems to me that for hundreds of years, universities were these religious, very conservative organisations. And only since the free speech movement in the 1960s, which was explicitly designed to challenge that conservative status quo, was when they started to lose that sense of purpose to transmit knowledge. So isn't, in a sense, academic freedom was the start of the problem <coughs> for universities? <laughs> and uh, Reem, yes, your question? Yeah, um, this might be me playing devil's advocate um, a little bit, but um, isn't a free society one in which 
um, businesses are able to require whatever they want to from their employers, from their employees, sorry. I mean, I, you know, I, I completely agree that program badges are absolutely ridiculous, but is, is the solution to wokery, you know, government regulation on, on what, what employers are actually allowed to require from their employees? Yeah, more very, very good questions. Um, on the stop and search, I mean, to come at that a little bit of a roundabout way, I mean, I do think one of the most horrific and um, con concerning aspects of woke thinking um, is the way it has become ingrained, not just ingrained within our justice system, within the or way that the police operate, but in the way that crime in general is seen through this lens of identity politics with some victims being kind of considered to be more worthy of uh, media attention and understanding and compassion uh, and at the same time some perpetrators considered to be more um, worthy of, of condemning um, than others. I mean, I, I have to say, I've not, I've not been keeping in touch with the news this morning, but certainly at seven o'clock, uh, the news today, <coughs> over the course of today, so events might have overtaken what I'm about to say, but certainly at seven o'clock this morning, there seemed an awful lot of excitement on the Radio 4 Today programme about the shooting in Copenhagen yesterday, that this may have been an act of white supremacy, um, um, an act of, of, of kind of white terrorism, if you like. And I, like I say, I'm sure events have overtaken me on that one, but, but it, it just seemed as if there's, a, there's this there's kind of good crime where we know where we are and we like to talk about it and it fits in neatly to a moral framework that we've predetermined. And there's bad crime, which is a little bit dangerous and worrying and we don't quite like to talk about it because it may bring up all kinds of morally and politically complicated issues. And uh, I would put knife crime on the streets of London very much into that territory where it seems to me that it's largely black kids who are being killed Killed, tragically, um, but also black kids who are largely responsible for perpetrating some of this crime as well. And, and this creates a situation where the police are just very, very uncomfortable about how to deal with it. And the government's very uncomfortable about how to deal with it. And nobody seems to be able to stand to intervene and actually take the moral high ground in this situation and, and sort it out. Whereas you can imagine a situation where if the uh, colour play wasn't quite the same, that this may be something that people felt more confident about intervening in. And, and for every day that we don't intervene in this situation, the risk is more lives are lost, whether that's terrorism or knife crime. Um, on universities, I couldn't disagree more, I'm afraid. Sorry, whoever said that. Um, I don't think academic freedom's to blame at all. And, and I think historically, um, you, we do need to look back 20 years at least before the free speech movement. It seems to me that it was much more, um, right from the outset of the Second World War, we got back as far really as the 1940s, 1950s, um, where the whole, in in the mindset of some academics and, and kind of academic movements more broadly, really the I think I think they're wrong. And what I'm about to say I think was wrong, but I think this was how it was understood by some people, where the whole industrial scale of the Second World War, and particularly the way that this played out in relation to the Holocaust, was almost seen as, as the epitome of Enlightenment principles. Um, so I can't remember who it was earlier, was, I think it was you, was talking about the kind of the scientific logic, the rationality, the push for reason, that that was, that was interpreted, that those values and principles were interpreted as having been taken to their logic extreme um, in the industrialized experience of war, uh, in the experience of the Holocaust. So, so immediately after the Second World War, the kind of rejection, obviously not just of the values that had, had led to war, 
as in fascism, um, but the enlightenment values of reason, rationality, logic, scientific method, those principles were rejected too by large parts of an academic elite. And, and it was really in the process of rejecting those values um, that paved the way then for the, the kind of hollowing out, if you like, of, of universities as institutions. You know, the, the asserting the moral good of, of reason, of progress, of rationality that became much more difficult things to do and then tied up with that and, and kind of trailing in its way also became making the case for, for beauty, um, for um, beauty as a good in and of itself. So, I mean, you go right back to um, JFK, you know, in the US context was, was really pushing the way for knowledge as, as a public good, he was arguing, which sounds way more progressive than the way in which we talk about knowledge nowadays. But, but he was very clear that it was to serve a purpose, that this was for uh, kind of the national economy, that, that, that universities were there to benefit. Um, the, um, at the time, it would have been the East-West space race if you like, that, that you, universities needed to be harnessed for this particular purpose in the pursuit of knowledge. And, and I guess the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it's to say that knowledge was not worthwhile endeavor in its own terms, that there was nothing to be gained from the pursuit of beauty, the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of knowledge as an end in and of itself. Uh, and it's, it's when you've hollowed out those purposes, first of all, um, that academic freedom could have been um, put to a really good cause of advancing. I would argue it would be fundamentally intrinsic to the advance of knowledge, um, but it only becomes a kind of relativist demand um, once you've jettisoned every other, every other purpose. Um, on the comment about you know pronoun badges and a, and a free society and a companies uh, not not free to do what they want, I mean of course to some extent they are, but I think we it's worth asking when we ask that question you know why why are all these companies being free to do what they want like in the same way as as every other company you know why why does Halifax bring in pronoun badges? because and NatWest and Ben and & Jerry's and every company is kind of all going in the same direction. And, you know, ultimately, I think in, under capitalism, you can be a free marketeer, you know, that's great. Obviously, sitting in the IEA, I have to well, say that. Well, you have that. to say that, yeah. Um, but, but what is it that workers are selling? You know, to me, fundamentally, what you, what you sell is, is your time, you know, and you should be able to keep your dignity and your soul separate from that. I don't think anybody can be made to, to sell their soul, to sell their integrity or their dignity or their sense of who they are. And it seems increasingly that capitalism is not content with you just giving your skills and your labor for an hour. It actually wants something far more intrinsic, which I don't think it has any right to expect of people. Uh, before we conclude, we'll have one last question and a quick response because we're running a little late. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, the title of your book uh, very provocatively posits that the woke have won and by inference the culture war is over and therefore the voices of reason, rationality, humanism and enlightenment should just pack up and go home or perhaps even into exile. Uh, is that what you truly believe? Is it over? And if not, if the war is still raging, what can be done to fight back? Mm -hmm. Good question to end on. So no, I don't think it, I, I think woke has won for now, if you like, brackets for now. Um, I don't think it's won for all time. I mean, for one thing, I wouldn't be sat here if I thought it had won for all time. There'd be no point us having this conversation. We just put the white flag up and surrender and, and go home and get an early night. Um, and and you know, get some new pranks. <laughs> I, think, I think, as I was saying earlier, you know, I think there is still very much all to play for. But I think uh, the How Woke One, I think it's a very, very important title because as Mark was asking in one of the questions earlier, 
you know, I think people who are woke don't like to admit the power that they've got. So I think it's an important title to point out to people who are woke, you know, look at, look, you, you know, you have been successful, own the power you have, if you like, be responsible for this, be held to account for what you've done. But also I think for people on, on our side of the fence, if I can be so bold, um, you know, it's important for us to recognize the, the scale of the fight ahead of us and, and not be complacent about the task in hand. You know, we, we have a mammoth task to push back against this. We really, really do. And I wouldn't want to underestimate that at all. But at the same time, you know, there's a chink and where there's a crack, at risk of Leonard, quoting Leonard Cohen, you know, that's where the light gets in. And, and that's, that's where it's open for us to push back and start challenging some of these things. Um, and that's how we do it. You know, two things, free speech, democracy. We, we shine a light on what's going on. We hold it up to public scrutiny, whether that's what's happening in schools, um, you know, with, with shop workers being made to wear pronoun badges. We expose this. We say, look, this is what's happening. We put it to the court of public opinion and we find every single time that public opinion rejects it, it's only when they can do this behind closed doors that they get away with it. The more we subject it to sunlight, the more we subject it to democracy, the less they're able to get away with it. Great. Before I thank uh, Joanna, um, there are a number of things I need to say. First of all, many thanks to the IEA Book Club members and IEA donors more generally who have made tonight's uh, event possible in the first place. If you want to join the book club, talk to the inimitable Alex, standing like a, a sort of sinister figure <laughs> at the back, um, a real commissar, uh, or you can find out more details on the IEA website. Uh, I'd like to thank, in addition to Alex, uh, Joe Dinage, who's been recording this. Well, we hope he has. I'm pretty certain he has. Uh, Jamie Legg, uh, Reem, and all the other uh, colleagues of mine at the IEA who've made this event uh, possible. Uh, now, you can start your Christmas shopping early. Uh, be ahead of the game by buying <laughs> Joanne's book. You can buy it to annoy, you know, relatives and friends of yours who don't share the, the, the same politics, as well as those who would benefit from it. And it leaves me uh, last, but by no means least, to thank you, Joanna, for coming all the way to London uh, to talk to us, to answer our questions. Um, your book is a, a hugely important contribution. I mean, talking about shining a light. It shines a light on this disturbing authoritarian tendency in a, in a way that I don't think any book so far has been able to do, certainly uh, in this country. Uh, because this is an authoritarianism, as we've been discussing, that doesn't as yet really have a name. Uh, it doesn't really have a, a profile, a presence. And so that is the reason I think so many people in this society, they know something's going on, they hear odd bits and pieces about what's happening in universities and the police calling on, you know, turning up at people's homes to check on their thinking and all this kind of stuff that's going on. But they don't, they can't really bring it together. They can't conceptualize it in the same way we could see threats to our freedom historically from movements who were overtly uh, authoritarian. So your book is, a, is an incredibly important contribution to the struggle for cultural freedom uh, in this country. And that's why I urge you all to buy it and then have more drinks on the IA. So Joanna, on behalf of the IA, thank you so much. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast. <laughs>